Jewish Education and Media is pleased to present L'Chaim, a program that highlights the people, issues, and events of importance to the Jewish community. Now here is your host, Rabbi Mark Golub. I'm Mark Golub, and those of you who've been with me over the years know that while my greatest professional love is everything to do with the beauty and wisdom and genius and joy of the Jewish tradition and the Jewish people, my other non-professional loves include, first and foremost, my family, my wonderful wife Ruth, our five gorgeous, wonderful, exceptionally lovely children. And many of you know that my daughter Dara is a mainstay here at Shalom TV. But in addition to my children, I have two other non-professional loves, theater. And since I was six years old, I've been an enormous baseball fan. And I've spoken about this many times, about my first hero, Jackie Robinson, how I became a fanatic Brooklyn Dodger fan in my youth. And Gil Hodges, Jackie Robinson, Pee Wee Reese, Billy Cox, George Shuba, Duke Snyder, Carl Farilla, Roy Campanella, Carl Erskine, Billy Lowe's, Clem Labine, Don Newcomb, Ralph Branca, all of them. By the way, a young kid signed as a bonus baby out of Lafayette High School, Sandy Koufax. Never really pitched well for the Brooklyn Dodgers, but all were part of my family day to day. And I, like all Dodger fans, I was crushed when after the 1957 season, Walter O'Malley moved the Dodgers out of Ebbets Field and relocated them to the Los Angeles Coliseum at the time, while the New York Giants and Willie Mays moved to San Francisco. And when five long years later, the New York Mets were born as an emotional amalgamation of the Dodgers and Giants, my brother and I became huge Met fans, suffered through some of the most dismal and inept seasons imaginable until Tom Seaver arrived on the scene with Jerry Kuzman and Bud Harrelson and Cleon Jones and Tommy Agee and Ron Swoboda and the Miracle Mets of 1969 came out of nowhere, stole the National League pennant from Leo DeRocher, the hated once manager of the New York Giants, then the manager of the Chicago Cubs. Then they swept Henry Aaron's Atlanta Braves in the first year of championship playoffs, 1969, and then went on to upset the heavily favored Baltimore Orioles of Frank Robinson and Brooks Robinson and Boog Powell and Jim Palmer in just five games to become the amazing world champions. By the way, this edition of the Chaim is for anybody who loves baseball. If you don't love baseball, I don't know if you're going to love this edition of the program because for me, the game is also a link to my grandfather, my father, and now to my son and grandson. And in some strange way for me, there's always been a subtle link between the way in which baseball ties families together throughout the generations and the way the Jewish tradition bonds people together, generation to generation, binds the generations into one wonderful continuum. And while I'm not equating Judaism with baseball, in somehow both, somehow both do create bonds that transcend time and place. And there's a purity to the game of baseball and a splendor and a grace and even in some way a religious significance, all its own. And it's amazing to see how many rabbis are huge baseball fans, Red Sox fans, Washington National fans today, of course Yankee fans, Met fans, and on and on and on and on. And at the same time, the joke is, if you put a book together of Jews and baseball, it would be very thin indeed. Or would it? Maybe the idea that Jews have not been 
good enough to play the game in any great numbers, or that Jews in professional sports is something of an oxymoron. Maybe that's a myth, an error. And then this very weighty book comes along to suggest something very different. This book is entitled American Jews and America's Game, Voices of a Growing Legacy in Baseball. And it's written by a wonderful human being, Larry Ruttman, who I'm thrilled is joining us now to talk about both the game he loves and the Jews who played it and the conversations he had with many of the people who have made baseball real for him and for us and who helped shape the game both on and off the field. And Larry, it's a pleasure to be sitting with you and to have your book in front of me. And first of all, congratulations on doing an extraordinary work. Uh, you should know that as we tape at this very moment, this is the premier day for Larry Ruttman's American Jews in America's Game. And we happen to be taping this on April 1st, which is the opening day of the 2013 baseball season. What better time for you to be sitting with me to talk about your book, American Jews in America's Game. Thank you for joining us. Well, I'm glad to be here, Mark, and there's no better day. April Fool's Day. <laughs> I mean, I hope we fool them all and uh, the book gets out there all over. Because, you know, as a matter of fact, taking something away from your remarks, uh, first of all, I beat you. Uh, I was only five years old when my father took me to see a Yankee Red Sox doubleheader where the people came on the field in 1936, and I remember that big number four for Lou Gehrig. Yes. And uh, then a few years later, of course, I became a big Ted Williams fan. And <laughs> you used, are from Boston. I am from Boston. They used to call me Ted when I was a kid, not because I could hit, because I was such a fan they were making fun of me. But, uh, yeah, the book comes out today. And, uh, you know, it's really about, uh, it, it's, baseball is the backdrop. It's really about America and American Judaism over the last eight years. Because interviewing all these people from Marvin Miller to the players on the field, you know, of the 43 stories, half of them are uh, uh, players and half of them are people off the field. And it goes back 80 years, starting with Hank Greenberg, the only deceased person in the book. And what I was trying to do was to, uh, in, in, a, in a modest way, show a small part of American history, that part that involves the Jewish people in the United States. And I think taking a successful segment of Jewish society, players and officials and writers and so forth, associated with the game of baseball, really the vessel through which a lot of assimilation of Jews, Eastern European Jews, especially into American culture, took place. And I, you know, I had seen a lot of books on Jews and baseball, and I thought a lot of them were thin, as you <laughs> said. Yes. They were thin because they dwelled on earned run averages and batting averages. Well, any baseball fan's going to find that stuff in here, but they're going to find a lot more. That's correct. Because I tried to follow these people from the time they were young to how they got to be the person they were. So they talk about anti-Semitism. They talk about Israel, assimilation, intermarriage, all that stuff. And it really... It interested me. I was fascinated talking to them, so I hope that it fascinates them. And just one other point, Mark, is that, you know, a, a lot of oral history, so to speak, are just the, all you see is the, is what the person said, and you don't get the questioner. I wrote this book up, like I did my first book on Brookline, Massachusetts, my hometown, as a, as a conversation to try and bring it to life. So I'm in it, you know, not in a big forward way, but I'm there. And it gives me a chance, if I want to revert to the third person, to put in a few side remarks and so forth. So it was, it was a fascinating thing. Larry has given you a good sense, by the way, of how the book is structured. It is a book of oral histories. And what uh, I, I say history, it's really interviews. As Larry just said, the only person who is deceased as we are talking today is the great Hank Greenberg. But what Larry did was talk to individuals who've been involved in the world of baseball on the field and off the field. And he's broken it up by decades, beginning with the 1930s. And he has gone and spoken to individual after individual after individual. Um, I would say, I, my own sense, Larry, is about 80% of the people I knew and about 20% I met through your book. But what he has done is he has taken, um, I don't know, five, six, seven, 10, chap uh, 10 pages with some photographs, some of which he has taken himself, 
And what he's tried to do is give you a sense of these individuals by, in essence, recording an interview with them and putting it into the book. So it begins with Hank Greenberg, and interestingly enough, he talks to Barney Frank. We may get to that. He talks to, again, if you know baseball, some of these names will resonate for you. He talks to Al Rosen. Then he talks to Alan Dershowitz. And you've heard Dershowitz uh, speak with me a number of times about his love of baseball. And he did a, he's doing a show right now that you may be seeing on Shalom TV. He sits with another individual in Larry's book, Jeffrey Gurak, who's a professor of American Jewish history at Yeshiva University. You've seen him many times on Shalom TV. And Alan Dershowitz and, and uh, Jeff did a session at the Center for Jewish History on Jews in Basketball. But Jeffrey is also in this book, as is Alan Dershowitz, talking about their sense of baseball and some of the things you've heard him talk about. Uh, Jeff, he talks about here as well as at what Alan does. But it, it goes person by person through Art Chamsky and Ron Bloomberg, uh, Theo Epstein, who is now a, uh, he, had, he helped create the Boston Red Sox, and now he is with the Chicago, Chicago which one? Chicago Cubs, Cubs right. Uh, to Gabe Kapler. I'm interested in, uh, by the way, Kevin Euclid, who is starting today, batting cleanup for the New York Yankees, a perennial Red Sox. I don't know how, I you, just emailed I don't, I don't know how you How do you deal with the fact that Kevin Euclid, you're, you're a big Red Sox fan, and here Kevin Euclid is starting today for the New York Yankees. Yeah. That's fine. How life works, you know? Yeah, Kevin Euclid, uh, you know, I untitled the story, Hard Work Pays Off. He's a wonderful guy. And, uh, you know, he made that remark a couple of months ago that uh, his best days were his, best, were his Red Sox <laughs> days. He'll do wonderfully for the Yankees because he'll play hard wherever he is. He's really hard okay. those guy. I want to understand how this book comes to be. So you did one oral history before of Brookline, but something moved you. And you are a lawyer by trade. You are a writer as well, but how do you decide to do this, and how do you get access to so many of the people who you talk to in this book? Uh, that, that's a very interesting question, Mark. I'm glad you asked that. Uh, did, yeah, you do the, uh, did you do the book because you love baseball? Yeah, I do love baseball, I, uh, and I did the book partly because of that. But I also, how did it come to pass? After my first book, I was doing an adult education course on the art of the interview, and when it got over, the class, you know, they write up what they thought of the teacher, and they were very nice to me. And they said, what are you going to do for your next book? And I said, well, I don't know. I haven't really thought about that. Uh, I said, but I can't do it in the same style because I won't know the people as well. They said, oh, don't do it in the same style, that conversational style I spoke about. And two days later, an idea floated up in my brain about doing a book on Jews and baseball, but doing it differently by going really deep into the psyches and they're growing up. Okay, but why Jews and baseball? Well, I know baseball very well. Mm -hmm. I probably know baseball better than I know Judaism, and I did learn a lot about myself as a Jew doing this book. Wouldn't it be interesting to talk to players and writers and owners and people like that and find out how they grew up, how they got into baseball, how they grew up as Jews, intertwining those subjects? That would be interesting to me from any angle. Okay. Because I love America as well, and so it was all three of those subjects. Tell me about yourself as a Jew. Where are you? To what extent did you have a strong Jewish identity that you would want to not only do a book about baseball, and as you say, you also love America, but was the Jewish part of you in any way driving this book? Yes, I think so, but not because I'm an observant Jew. I mean, I was, I was bar mitzvah at the Kahal of Israel in Brookline, Massachusetts, I really am falling away. You know, I would observe Rosh Hashanah by not going to my office or Yom Kippur because I thought that was disrespectful for, to do. But would I go to temple? No, not really. Maybe occasionally, but not very much. Do you feel you had a strong Jewish identity? Oh, yes. I always felt as though I had a strong Jewish identity. I, I was very proud of being a Jew. My wife and I visited Israel you know, on the 25th anniversary of the... Uh, uh, of the country back in 1960-something. Uh, and uh, we went to some dangerous places. I didn't realize how dangerous. Uh, and um, so that I, w I always strongly identified as a Jew. I was very proud of our history. And I always felt that uh, you could be what you wanted being a Jew. So that uh, it appealed to me to do this. And then 
speaking to people like Professor Gurak, who said, you know, I would say to him or to Rabbi Paley, I'm not a very observant Jew. And then they would, they would ask me about my life and they would say, yeah, you're being observant in your own way. You're very observant mm -hmm. because I do practice tzedakah, which was a word I was not particularly familiar with, uh -huh. but now I'm very familiar with it. But from the beginning when I became a lawyer, I, I immediately took on a Jewish little brother through the Jewish Big Brother Association. So it was somehow in me to do those kinds of things. And I think as I've grown up, Mark, uh, to, I think that I've become less centered on myself and more centered on other people. And now I, I really don't, you know, I used to think about myself more, and now there's a certain liberation that comes with age, and hopefully if you live long enough, you grow up a little more or a little, you become more mature. And uh, so that um, now uh, I feel even more strongly about my Judaism and, and feel so proud that here's a religion that has uh, genetically or otherwise, or, or just because of, of having existed for so many th thousands of years, uh, has these traditions of learning and giving and community and carrying on the word from generation to generation, how amazing it is that living in the diaspora for a couple of thousand years, and uh, that the Jews continued to exist where all these other ancient peoples did not, and to uh, once again gather themselves together in Israel. It's all so very, very amazing. And um, you know, Mark, as I talk to these people off the field, on the field, uh, you know, there's this thing about, you know, athletes are centered on the field and they don't think too much. Well, I don't know about that. I think, I think they're very bright people. I think that to become successful in anything you do, whether it's physical or intellectual, you've got to have some discipline, you've got to have some drive, you've got to have some uh, ability to work hard and to focus. And these, these folks do. And um, so uh, I'm very... Um, I've become much more of a Jew. I mean, I haven't returned to the temple, but um, I feel very, very Jewish, and uh, I think it th comes out in my speech and the things I say to people. And, uh, you know, I'm not an atheist by a long shot. I certainly believe in God because, like, I, was, I read a biography of Einstein recently, and he uh, said that, um, it was, I mean, I don't, you know, who can compare themselves to Einstein, but he did say that, um, uh, that as far as he was concerned, there's so much order in the universe that he doesn't understand it all, but if there's that much order, there has to be some guiding spirit there someplace. And that's, that's sort of how I believe that there, there, there has to be a God. But, yeah, but the point I was going to make was in, in Judaism, you can be an atheist and still be a Jew. How, how fantastic is that? <laughs> You've learned very, very well. You've learned very, very well. And um, being a Jew is not necessarily about observance, but it is part of being, a, this, being part of the Jewish people and the Jewish family. And it sounds to me like you have that inside yourself very, very deeply. Now, in some way, you're using this book to tell the story of American Jewry. Um, uh, just some questions about choice. You begin with Hank Greenberg. And now that Hank Greenberg is the picture on the cover, um, and he was, you know, outside of Sandy Koufax, he probably was the greatest Jewish baseball player to ever play the game. Was there any question in your mind as to whether Hank Greenberg or Sandy Koufax would go on the cover? Yes. And how did you choose Hank Greenberg? I didn't. Who did? <laughs> <laughs> Sandy. And why? He didn't want to be on the cover. And because he didn't want to, you didn't put him on the cover. Well, I saw no reason to offend him. Okay, uh, fair. Very, very, okay. And, uh, you know, I mean, uh, as a matter of fact, the picture that was going to be on the cover is the frontispiece of the book. If you turn, the it's, next, a, it's a drawing. Yes. Oh. And, and as a matter of fact, Sandy told me he'd never seen it before, but it's a marvelously yes. striking drawing. And uh, Marvin Miller, uh, I quote there, as saying, great athlete, courageous person. And Sandy, you know, he was, he was very gracious about it. He made it very clear. He said, Hank started it all. Let him be on the cover. And, uh, and I, so that was fine. And um, so we did that. And okay. then it was almost too late to get that frontispiece in there. 
and there was a lady at the University of Nebraska Press who said, let's do a second frontispiece so we don't have to disturb the order of the list of illustrations and recast it for the printer. And at the last minute, that one of Sandy Koufax was put in. There's a couple of other pictures in his story yes. about holding up four balls for the four no-hitters, the last one, the perfect game, and dancing uh, on, on the Bob Hope right. show. Yeah, so, but, um, but that picture of Sandy Koufax, it would have been you know, less of a book had, not, had that not been there. But I do think, contrary to what you just said, Mark, that Hank Greenberg was the greatest of all uh, Jewish players. What did I say? You said, you said something like, uh, except for Sandy Koufax. Well, I don't want to argue with but you. No, no, let's put it this way. Sandy Koufax may have been the greatest pitcher ever. Hank Greenberg, if you can believe this, Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig have the highest ratio of, run, of uh, runs, runs, ba run, runs batted into at bats. Third is Hank Greenberg. Yes, but he was a great, great ball player. And fourth is Ted Williams. So that tells you how great he was. And you no, I, I, the Ted reason Williams, I, yeah. he was great because of the uh, the fact that he made such an impression at a time when anti-Semitism was rife and the Nazis were rising, that Jews weren't just weaklings; they were strong, big, handsome, rough guys that could f fight with their fists as well as knock the ball over any fence. Mm -hmm. Did anything surprise you as you do this book? Either it surprised you about the individual you were writing about or it gave you an insight into the development of Jewish life because you were talking to ball players who were in the public eye or and many executives in this book as well mm -hmm. and writers. Mm -hmm. But did anything surprise you? Yeah. Tell me. They were all different. And maybe, maybe, that's, maybe that's something about the Jews. I mean, let's say this, Mark. This is... This is an acad it's an academic book in this sense. could be used in college courses and stuff like that. But it's not academic in the sense of graphs and, you know, there's no proof of anything. It's all anecdotal. Um, but it does, but anecdotally, it does go to certain things like, uh, you know, what is it about the Jews' background that lets them, you know, be successful in various things and uh, what are the traditions in their culture. Um, I uh, interviewing this uh, all these people. Nobody's story was the same. I, I wanted to get. I mean, Al Clark is a great guy, and uh, you talk about my pictures. I took a picture of him that I love. Um, he's just a very colorful guy, but he did some wrong things, and he wound up in jail, even though he's a great umpire. But it's a redemptive story, and um, so that um, uh, I wanted to have something like that. And then there's Tybee Eisen who played in the All-American Girls Baseball League back in the Second World War, who now in her late 80s, and grew up in a Jewish home, but, you know, so, and played football and uh, so forth, and uh, really didn't practice Judaism. And I wanted to have a woman in there. Uh, there's a couple of women, she and a friend, and also played in that league, also Jewish, grew up in a Catholic home in Providence. Every story was different. I mean, Ian Kinsler didn't know that he was, uh, he did, never acknowledged that he was Jewish until Jewish fans kept pushing him. Oh, Ian, your father comes from the Bronx? And you got relatives in the Bronx? And uh, so I, that was the last interview I did in the third base dugout at Fenway Park of Ian Kinsler. Now, Ian is married a Catholic girl. I, I don't know how his children are going to be brought up. I don't think they've decided that yet. He's a wonderful player. He rolls his pants up to his knees like the old-time players. Uh, he's very respectful to his coaches. Um, you know, he was called away at the end of our interview. The uh, traveling uh, communications director of the Rangers said, "You got to get into the meeting." He's very respectful. He would never say he would never say, uh, uh, "I want to stay here and talk for three or four minutes." As a matter of fact, I said, "Give us two more minutes." It was me, not him. And he said, I, "You know, I, everybody who plays this game." Uh, who stays in the major league is going to make a lot of money. But that mm -hmm. doesn't change my life. Now we live in a nice home. I'm thankful. But, you know, I, 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 it, it's not going to change the way I live. I'm going to be, I want to be respectful to my coaches. I want to play the game. Later I'd like to stay in it. Maybe I'll announce. In other words, what I'm saying is that <laughs> somehow uh, it could be American values. It doesn't have to be Jewish values. But all these players, let's take an example, the players, every single one of them, from Craig Breslow who went to Yale and took biochemistry and all that stuff and was admitted to NYU Law School and they kept it open for him for three or four years, 
uh, to Kevin Euclid, who's a very bright, articulate guy, or Gabe Kapler, who has a foundation for his, that he set up because his Catholic wife was raped in uh, high school, and then after that they became friends in high school, and they've been together ever since. He's probably 36 or 7 now. They've been married for a long time. So that um, they were all very centered, mm -hmm. focused, reliable, good citizens. Uh, I didn't find one of them that was off the wall in any way. And um, some of them were way out at the edge of Judaism, or even beyond the pale of Judaism, even though they had a Jewish identity. And some of them were close in. Um, who were some of those who were close in? Well, Ken Holtzman, for example, whom I interviewed in Israel, uh, was the winningest uh, Jewish pitcher in Major League history, even more than Sandy Koufax. Of course, Sandy Koufax's career ended at 30 because of his arthritic left arm. I mean, God knows if it, that never happened, he would have won 350 or 400 games. So, uh, but Holtzman was a great pitcher. You know, he... In four years during the years in the early 70s when he was with the Oakland A's and they had championship teams, between World Series and uh, regular competition, he won over 80 games in four seasons, like over an average of over 20 games. Uh, he grew up in a very Jewish home in St. Louis, I think, and his mother and father were, uh, you know, uh, not orthodox, I don't think, but, you know, pretty, pretty religious folks. And uh, he grew up as an observant Jew. Still is, I think, an observant Jew. And, um, but yet he told of, uh, he, and he does have anti-Semitic stories to tell, but he wouldn't tell them to me. I think one is out there that's well known, that uh, Leo DeRocha, who had a good reputation as a manager, but not nearly as good a reputation as a guy, once when he was asked, uh, where, where is Ken Holtzman? Uh, I'm trying to remember which team that might have been the Cubs. It was the Cubs. Um, is he, said, uh, he said, oh, you mean the, 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 something, you know, sort of a, uh, not an honorific, uh, mm -hmm. the opposite, you know, with a Jewish. A slur. Oh, slur, yeah. Uh, but, uh, but he didn't tell me any. He told me. He In general, did you hear many anti uh, stories of anti-Semitism from yes. these gentlemen? What's, what was the nature of the anti-Semitism? Well, Al Rosen who played for Cleveland, you gotta wonder why he's not in the Hall of Fame because he won the Most Valuable Player Award unanimously and then he was the executive of the year, the executive of the year with the Giants about 1989 and he's still living out in Rancho Mirage and he's a great, very intelligent guy who has a lot to say. Uh, was a tough kid, he grew up in Miami and he could use his fist and his nose was broken 12 times and he told me about an event where Matt Batts, who I remember him, B-A-T-T-S, was a catcher not a utility second level catcher with the Red Sox. He told a story about how anti Semitic Matt Batts was, and he would call, he'd call Rosen all sorts of names, and Rosen naturally wanted to fight him. He could fight. And three guys, he, 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 Al Rosen became friendly with the great players on the Red Sox Ted Williams, Bobby Dewar, Johnny Pesky, Tom DiMaggio. Uh, Ted was not involved in this one, but the other three were. And they restrained bats, and they were, they were, they were all great people. Dorr still lives. He's in his late 90s. Pesky just died, and the, all four of them were great buddies. He, um, and they, they all loved Williams, despite his outsized <laughs> personality. <laughs> but uh, uh, so that, um, that, was, that was sort of a violent one. And Hank Greenberg, there's a story in here about how he wound up thrashing about... Uh, I guess it was uh, Jim Bagby Sr., who in the last year that Greenberg played with the Pirates in 1947, Greenberg botched a play at first base, and uh, Bagby said something uh, anti-Semitic. You, you would, you know, Jew something, kike or whatever it was. And uh, Greenberg said, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> when we get off the field, and they had a big fight mm -hmm. that was uh, that was in the uh, in the clubhouse. And Kiner, who's a very very sweet tempered guy, told it sort of like it, yeah, it was a fight. But um, ironically, Rip Sewell, who was on the same team, he threw the Ephus pitch that Ted Williams hit for a home run in the 1946 All Star game, and was a great pitcher, and had a fight. 
I say ironically, because he had a fight with Greenberg when they were back in 1934. So this is already 1947. And they made up because Greenberg whacked a double to win a game for Sewell. Sewell told, told about that fight much more acrimoniously, much more, uh, what's the word, Bella, the, the real you know, bellicose nature of this skirmish, to use a word that U.S. Grant is always using in his memoirs, skirmish, that could mean lots of people dead. And um, so, uh, and then um, David Newham, who now is Jews, Jews for Jesus, whose father is in the Hall of Fame as a sports writer for the Los Angeles Times, Ross. Uh, David is another sweet-tempered guy. Uh, you know, Ross is a wonderful guy. Became a top journalist uh, without ever having gone, taken a journalism course. I don't know that he ever went to college. He's written several books. You know, he's, and he's very thoughtful and... And, and David is, is, is a wonderful young guy. He played about six, seven years in the major leagues. And he didn't react to the stuff that went on in the clubhouse, jocular stuff. Nui, they call him Nui the Jewy. So, but what he told me was that it upset him. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but he didn't want to, you know, destroy the, you know, clubhouse. You want your team to get along. And David is, you know, not the kind of guy that would get in your face so that, um, so that he, he put up with it, but he didn't like it. Some of the other stuff uh, is uh, a little milder, mm -hmm. um, you know, a joke here and there. And, um, but they, they, I think that uh, in anti-Semitism, I think, um, you know, has diminished over the course of time. I mean, let's face it, the, the Jews have a good time in the United States. You know, Larry, you titled a chapter on Hank Greenberg, which begins the book, Revealing the Survival of American Judaism Generation by Generation. And it's in that sense that you are trying to show more than simply the player and the game, but how does it reflect the arc of American Jewish life? The Hank Greenberg, where you asked your question, he sort of put it all aside, like he wasn't a Jew, although he was because he lived an extremely Jewish life. I, I call him a great man. I think he was a great man. The story on him, you'll notice, is much more about him as a person and his relationship to his children and his friends than it is about his baseball feats and his relationship to his, where he came from, being a Jew, and America because he was a great soldier. And I think he really wasn't a, a great man. Who was the greatest Jew of the 20th century? Could have been Einstein. I think it really was Hank Greenberg because his, the, sim, the symbolic effect he had on his, on his, uh, on his fellow Jews was tremendous. I'm sure that what I experienced, you've experienced as well, that Jews love to point to Jews who are successful in any public arena. And therefore, Jews love the fact that every now and then there is a Jewish ball player they can identify. I really believe that the, the two enormous stars who were Jewish were Hank Greenberg and Sandy Koufax. Absolutely. And then there were many, many second level, very, very fine ball players. Yeah. And there were many ball players who were utility players as well. And, you, you know, I don't know what a thrill it was for you to be able to deal with Sandy Koufax and whether he was, you know, whether he, in your mind he is someone bigger than life to you. But I was just curious as to how you, I mean, you never got to meet Hank Greenberg because he had passed away. So I'm playing. You did see him play? Well, you were a lucky guy. I wish I had. Um, Sorry, I made a home run <laughs> okay. to the opposite field. <laughs> but, um, you know, what Sandy Koufax mean to you? Sandy Koufax called me at home at the behest of your friend, my friend, my publicist, Marty Appel, because Marty knew him. And uh, I pick up the phone, and a deep voice is on the other end. Uh, you know, uh, uh, this is Sandy Koufax. I didn't doubt it for a minute. And uh, so we entered into a, he called me up to tell me he didn't want to let me interview him because he had reached the age where he felt that he didn't have to do, he didn't want to do what he didn't want to do. So I said, well, listen, Sandy, I, you know, I can't argue with you. I've, I'm a few years older than you, and I've reached the same age. I said, but, and then I tried to persuade him <laughs> three different ways, and it didn't work out. But in the course of the conversation, which went so well for 15 or 20 minutes, I could build a story combining that with talking to his battery mate who told him to slow down a little, and that mm -hmm. brought about the control that gave him the career he had, uh, which um, was Norm Sherry, 
picture of Norm Sherry. I mean, he may be Jewish, but he looks so much like a major <laughs> leaguer. And he was a manager, too, Norm Sherry, That's one of correct. the few Jewish managers. The other thing that many Jews don't understand is how many Jews were part of baseball behind the scenes, were baseball executives. And I want you to talk about, uh, first of all, Marvin Miller is somebody you have in the book. I love Marvin Miller. And Marvin Miller may be the man credited more than any other for creating what is now called modern baseball Absolutely. because he changed the entire structure, the financial structure, and what had been a form of indentured servants here yeah. of ball players right. and, and really created uh, free agency and the ability for ball players to make an enormous amounts of money. Right. And the Baseball Players Union is the greatest, strongest of all of the sports unions. Absolutely. Tell me about your meeting with Marvin Miller. Well, as I, I just said, I love Myron Miller, and, uh, you know, it, it, that to me, uh, he was the person that um, made the deepest impression on me uh, because uh, I went to his house back in 2000, his apartment in, uh, the, uh, in Manhattan in 2007. I guess it was the first year I started writing the book, and he, his wife was alive then. Marvin at that time was about 90. He has, of course, since passed away. He passed away, yeah. And, you know, we became friends. I'll tell a little about that. Um, you know, uh, I only met him face to face that one time, but we talked on the phone many times after that, even up until the last month before he passed away. Um, so that I put on the digital voice recorder, and then we talked for three hours. I didn't talk that much about what he did because everybody knows that. I wanted to know how he got to be the man that could do that. So I started way back when he was born. And uh, with the remarks about his mother, who was a wonderful person. So we talked for those three hours. And more and more, I, I, I got to feel an affection for him, uh, you know, uh, like a vuncular or like a grandfather figure. Um, I, I felt his essential decency. Hamish, is that the right word? Yes. I felt his essential decency and humility, really, uh, you know, I'd heard all these things when I was uh, when he was doing his stuff. He wants to be the commissioner. He's arrogant. He's, you know, it's all newspaper stuff, uh, and a, a lot of that was engineered by the owners. He's not that kind of a guy at all. I mean, he worked in the social welfare department in Brooklyn. Then he worked in the steel workers union. Not a lawyer, an economist, and um, he uh, he learned how to uh, he learned labor law. He learned how to argue effectively. So what he saw was a wrong, the, as you called it, the plantation mentality. He saw that wrong. And, um, and at that time, the job became open. And always the players have been represented by chosen people, chosen by the other side, you know. And the, by the owners. Did they, did they know the labor law? I don't know. Did they have the, the, uh, the, the welfare of the players in mind? I don't think, maybe some more than others, but not in the way that Marvin Miller and Don Fear. Uh, also did, Jewish. Also Jewish. And also in your book. Yeah, did after that. Um, so that um, his friend said to him, how could you want that job, Marvin? He says, well, because the law's with them, but they, they don't know it. They need somebody to, to they're going to win. We, ultimately, we'll win. And ultimately, he did win and brought in free agency. But he and Fear always respected the players. Is that Jewish? I don't know. Is that American? Is that just human being? Is that a good person? I don't know what it is. I'm not trying to classify it. I'm not a social scientist. What I do know is that they respected the players and they never moved without the players' assent. They didn't say, now this is what we're going to do. We're going to tell one, two, three, four, you're going to win. They, they, it was, that's why they were a strong union, because they're not guided by, uh, or told by one individual, this is the way we're going to do it. He, he, he knew and fear knew afterwards that these players are bright. They know what it's all about. And uh, let, uh, this should be a happy family. So I was impressed by, by that. And, uh, and so I really uh, felt a real affection for Marvin. And then as we talked afterwards, and his wife passed away and his health grew more frail, and he was worried that his doctors were not, uh, you know, he wanted, he, did, he couldn't get relief from some bad feelings that were painful. And he would ask me questions about that. And I put him in touch with a very fine 
Boston doctor that he talked to. And then, then what happened is that early last year, about this time, you know, and he had all this business about the Hall of Fame and he was never admitted, and I had that at the end of the story. Well, I spoke to him and he uh, told me about, um, he told me the story of why he was going to be speaking at NYU in April of last year. And it was because Arthur Goldberg was a friend of his in the Steelworkers Union. Then Goldberg was on the Supreme Court. Then Johnson told him to leave the Supreme Court. Then, John, uh, then Goldberg represented Kurt Flett, I think it was, in that first suit when Marvin was the executive director of the Players Association that Kurt Flood brought that began the push toward free agency. So the Goldberg and, uh, Goldberg and um, Marvin, Marvin Miller. Miller were very close. Yes. So what happened is that uh, George Mason, I think is the name, a university law school down in Washington, D.C., was doing a series of not only little baseball cards, but oil, oil paintings that were hanging and going to be hung in the Supreme Court, in the Supreme Court of the United States, of all the justices. And it was Goldberg's turn. And they decided, because of the connection between the two, they'd put a, a, a portrait of Marvin Miller there. Was, is he a lawyer? No. It, was he a Supreme Court justice? No. Is, is, there, is there some reason he should be in the Supreme Court of the United States? They thought so. It's a great uh, honor. Is, is, it is it's quite an honor. honor. So they said, they called him up and they said, can you come down for the installation <laughs> ceremony? He said, I'd love to, but I said, I, he said, I'm, I'm really, I really can't travel anymore. So they shifted it to NYU. Wow. He comes up to NYU. There's 150 people there. Don Fear. All, and uh, he gets up to talk. He talked for an hour and a quarter without notes. 95. An hour and a quarter. A and remarkable human being. He was a remarkable human being. And most of the time, not most of it, but some of the time he talked about the unfair level or, or how CEOs get paid. How do they get paid? By boards of trustees of their own choosing, not by the stockholders who should. How do baseball players get paid? He says they, they're getting, people say they're getting paid too much. They're getting paid by the people that pay it. It's America. It's buy and sell. Absolutely. And, and so that, uh, you know, Jerry Reinsdorf, who's, Notably, you know, handles a dollar with care. You know, he paid uh, Ozzy Yan a couple of million dollars to manage and some of the players over $10 million to play. He's doing that because he wants to be competitive. Absolutely right. So, so that I'm an hour and a quarter, imagine that. So that was, so I found out of that Marvin told me that story and I said, I got to get that in. And the, this is right close to printing, so I got it in. It's in the book. And as I put it there, as far as I remember, I'm paraphrasing my words, I said, Marvin Miller, good enough for the Supreme Court of the United States, not good enough for the Baseball <laughs> right. Hall of Fame. Right. And uh, I wanted Marvin to know it, so I called him up. Turned out that it was like four or five weeks before he died. His, his daughter was there, Susan, and she said, you know, he really can't come to the phone. And then he asked who it was, and, uh, and she said it was me on the phone. And my God, I mean, I, I feel so humbled by it. He came to the phone. And I asked him how he was feeling. He said, not too well. And I think we both recognized that it was the last conversation because he had talked to me about death before. And uh, I said, you know, Marvin, I, I just, you know, but that story I told you, I just, I wrote it up in the book. And I, I don't know, you, maybe you're not strong enough. For, I mean, it's only a couple of paragraphs. Would you like me to read it to you? He said, I would. So I read it to him. And, uh, and, and then we, we talked two or three minutes more and hung up the phone, and that was the end of the conversation. And it was very sweet of you. Larry, it was very, very sweet of you and good of you. Well, I wanted him to hear that. And uh, he, he, was, he was, in my mind, he was just a fantastic. He's, he, knowing Marvin Miller, even for the brief time we were together, for three hours in those telephone conversations afterwards, was one of the great experiences of my life. And even though we talked on a horizontal level, I certainly felt that he was a person of far greater accomplishments than I was. And he almost got into the class of Mozart. On the Chaim, I'm speaking with Larry Rutman, who is the author of American Jews and America's Game, a wonderful oral history of Jews and baseball. Larry, you know, um, the commissioner of baseball is Jewish, Bud Selig. 
what's your reaction to him? What was your experience with him? You know, talk for um, 60 seconds about Bud Selig. Um, yeah, I think he's a great family man, and I think he's uh, not a, uh, uh, a confrontational person. Uh, I interviewed him out in Phoenix at the uh, office of uh, Major League Baseball out there. And uh, at the end of the interview, which was, well, he came into the interview, I think he'd had probably a telephone conversation that irritated him. And when he walked in, he looked a little dour. But within five minutes, he was uh, talking, and we talked all about growing up in Milwaukee and stuff like that. And uh, then we had a very nice interview. And just at the end of the interview, his, uh, his daughter uh, walked in with his granddaughter, and he said, you got to meet my uh, daughter and granddaughter. And I went, out, I went out there and met them, Wendy and Natalie. And I said, can I, you know, and I took a picture of the three of them that, ap that appears in the book. And he told me about his father, who uh, began the, uh, the dealership out there that was so successful and uh, began uh, a tradition of wealth in the, in, the, uh, in the family. And I've been told by the rabbi in the book that that, is, that Judaism does not disrespect wealth. There's nothing wrong with wealth along with community and learning and stuff like that. So that uh, uh, he um, learned from his father the idea that it, uh, it's, it's better to make peace than not to make peace. And uh, I think that uh, he's been responsible in large part for a lot of innovations in baseball, but also for the labor piece. I mean, he chose Randy Levine, the who's now the president of the Yankees, to be his uh, peacemaker. And Another had, Jew, by the way. Yeah, and he had done in work He had done work as deputy mayor of New York for Rudy Giuliani. And uh, he, uh, uh, and on the other side was Don Fear, and the two of them got along very well. And they made some peace that's lasted for a while. And, uh, you know, in a piece that was done by, uh, by Mike O'Keefe yesterday in the news, uh, he he. He said that uh, he that I had called it a partnership. I, I might have done that. Um, I don't know that they'd agree that it's a partnership. But even as a uh, as as working together, we've seen a new era, and they're not so acrimonious yes. by a long shot. They have different interests. Um, but um, uh, and, uh, some people will say that uh, Bud Selig turned aside from the steroid scandal, as did a lot of people for a longer time than was necessary, but he addressed that ultimately. And uh, I think his, um, maybe I'm a little over 60 seconds, I think that a lot of people say he's the best commissioner ever, but I certainly think uh, that he'll be considered a very fine commissioner and another mm -hmm. Jewish guy. Yes, it just is amazing that the commissioner of baseball is Jewish. The individual who really revolutionized baseball, Marvin Miller, is Jewish. And uh, many of the owners, who discovered the World Series? Who discovered the World Series? Uh, Barney Dreyfus, who owned the Pirates <laughs> <laughs> from like the 1890s to 1930. And, then, and they just admitted him to the Hall of Fame just last year. I, uh, can't, have, I can't have you on, by the way, without asking you to make one comment in general about the fact that there also were, were so many wonderful Jewish sports writers who covered the game of baseball and beginning with Roger Kahn, but certainly not by any means ending there. And many of them in your book. And can you just speak for a, a moment about how you feel about the Jewish baseball writers? And it is the writer often who makes the game not only understandable, but romantic. And they did a fabulous job. Well, Roger Kahn, of course, uh, is, a, is a fascinating guy, and uh, he told lots of, he still told stories about anti-Semitism. He went to this fancy non-Jewish, you know, uh, school, private school when he was a kid, and he was on the football team, and he scored a touchdown, and they always called him, Izzy, 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 and he, you know, he really got fed up with that, and he thought it was uh, really, uh, you know, they never called him by his right name. Uh, and he's a very, you know, he's friends with Robert Frost, and he certainly had a way of telling a story, and a lot of them did. And I think the Jews love the word. Yes. So are you going to do a sequel, by the way, to this book? I'm going to do, do uh, You've got to do a sequel, because yeah. there's people here you still have to add. <laughs> <laughs> but wait, is Ryan Braun in this book? Yes, it is a, that's a story. Um, he was going through that... Uh, the steroids issue. The steroid issue, so I couldn't get him. But I was in touch with his... Uh, Agent, Nez Balelo, there's a name. And uh, Nez and I uh, emailed back and forth all the time. And in my persistent way, I kept trying to get an interview. 
tell Ryan I'll meet him in Manhattan at the fanciest place. I'll buy breakfast <laughs> and we'll, t you know, nothing worked. But, um, but there's no question that Ryan is the top Jewish player. At the moment, uh, right. At the moment. The issue is to what extent well, so, does Ryan so, want to identify as a Jew, and it seems to be somewhat problematic. Well, may, maybe it is problematic, but in any event, Balelo finally uh, went forward to the family, uh, and, and th there's a wonderful photograph of Ryan and his father. His father was, Holo he was, the ch was a child of Holocaust parents. He was born in Israel, came to the United States. Ryan, of course, born here, and his father is in a uniform, and Ryan's in a uniform. That's the face page to the decade of the tens, and Ryan made, and so I, I credited as properly it should be credited to, uh, to the family of Ryan Braun and to uh, Nez Bilalo. So he's in the book. Okay. Sean Green is another guy that I never could get to, even though I'd now met him. When I went to the, he played for the Israeli team in the qualified of the World Baseball Classic in Jupiter, Florida back in September. Still very handsome, played for the team. And we talked and I took his picture, but I never could get him for the book. But I did get a picture of him for the decade of the zeros because he was the guy. Okay. How does Rabbi Michael Paley get in your book? He comes from Brookline, Massachusetts. Oh, is that why he made the book? And also, the other answer to your question is, the more I went along, the more I said to myself, even a fan belongs in there. Like Alan Dershowitz, he thought he was going to take over for Pee Wee Reese. <laughs> he used to throw 100 balls every day before he went to school, in high school, to get C's. <laughs> he didn't know he was smart until he went to Brooklyn College. So that, uh, you know, so it just... Somehow it's okay for Alan to be in your book. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah. Anyway, um, I'm just saying to you, in your, in your sequel, you have to add any ball players who are Jewish who come in once the book is closed. You really should do John Sterling, who's the radio voice of the okay. New York Yankees. And his co... He has a co-announcer, the only woman who is doing play-by-play, play play, Susan Waldman. She's also Jewish. Oh, yeah, I've heard of her. I don't know whether either John, John is a very good friend of mine. I don't know whether he would want to come on and be part of a Jewish book. Susan also is problematic. But the other thing, you do, you definitely need one more rabbi in your book. How about you? It's got to be me. Because I, you don't know about me, but I took the picture that, that Joe DiMaggio likes more than any other picture. Did you? Yes, these, I took this picture. Really? And, and this was the picture he then gave out to all his friends. You, he makes them look nice. <laughs> <laughs> Spoken like a Ted Williams fan. Yes. And uh, I also took the picture of Jackie Robinson, which became the uh, lead photo in his obituary by Time Magazine. Those are great pictures. Aren't they? And I took a picture of Casey Stengel, which also made Time Magazine. Uh, I'm going to show you. I want to know if you who is that? Wait, wait a minute. That, is that... That's Tom Seaver. Oh, is that Tom Seaver? When he Seaver? played for the Cincinnati Tom Reds. Tom Terrific, my God. Yes, I also had him when he played. For, who is this? Did you take you taken all yeah, of these? Yeah, these are all my pictures. Well, that's Pete Rose. That's Pete Rose. Very, very good. I have, who is this? Because you're an old time guy. Milwaukee Braves. Wait, 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 wait. Eddie Matthews. Eddie Matthews. You are good. Okay. Who is this? Gee, I saw Eddie Matthews before he had a major league at bat in a city series game before his first major league game. When he was with the Braves playing lovely, against the Red Sox. He was a Sox, lovely guy. And he hit a tremendous shot. Yes, and you... Wait, you guy took against the 420 son. Yeah. You're a little older than I am then. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> okay, who is it? Oh, I know that's Willie Mays. That's Willie Mays. Great, that was a better Mays. picture of him. Who's this? You took great pictures. That's uh, the catcher, uh, Johnny Bench. You know your ball players. That's very, very good. Yes, I took all those pictures. Now, who is this? What's the team on that? Can, can I take a closer look yeah, at that? Yeah, you take a closer look. I'm not going to read the label. I'm putting my hands over the label. And is that you? Yes. <laughs> That's me. That was a boy. I, I was very lucky because I led a, a I've, I've been doing softball my whole life. And I was the manager, a uh, player and then manager of a team that won a national title. And... This is the when we won the national title. There we are, the whole team. Great. And then we went to Yankee Stadium, and they honored me at Yankee Stadium. And there on Yankee Stadium is they're giving credit to the four, RTN Four Corners. Wow. And there we are. This is with my son, with my ring that I was given up at Yankee Stadium. 
So I'm just telling you, and then here's one more picture. Who am I with here? Uh, let me just see. Who am I with? Do you know that Broadway star? Uh, That's Mark Golub with... Uh, do you know Ferris Bueller? Yeah. That's Matthew Broderick. Oh, Matthew Broderick. Matthew Broderick was playing on my softball team when we played in the Broadway Softball League. Was he good? He was very good. He played first place. I was, I was playing shortstop. And do you understand what a kick it is to be playing in the Broadway Softball League? I'm playing shortstop, and my first baseman is Matthew Broderick. Is that something? Now, I'm saying this to you. You're going to go far and wide before you find another rabbi who can bring out what I just brought out. I've got to be in your next book. Is it a deal? Absolutely. There's nobody else. <laughs> Larry Rutman, first of all, you are a lovely, lovely person, and you have very wonderful instincts, and, and the way you understand, it's human nature. And you know, Look, the book is about baseball and Jews, but it's really about people. Oh, yeah. And the more I got to know you, the more I understand. You are a very sweet person who understands the soul of human beings, and that's why the book is so successful. You're able to put down, using ball players who are Jewish, baseball executives who are Jewish, but what you're really showing is a slice of humanity. You are able to speak to someone and then shape an interview where you feel their soul, and that's an extraordinary gift you have, and I wish you called Tuv HaTzlecha with the book. It's called American Jews in America's Game. I hope everybody who loves baseball, and if you just want to understand people, it's a book about people who happen to play the game of baseball or be involved with the game of baseball, but you've done something very wonderful and important. I will look forward to every book you write, and I hope from time to time you come on, stop by and talk to me, Larry. It's a real pleasure knowing you. Well, Mark, that's a firm handshake, and I, you know those remarks are really great. I'm glad that you said those things, and it makes me feel very good. I hope I can live up to it. But in the interest of equal time, I'm pulling out my cell phone, and I want you to call my wife. <laughs> <laughs> my guess is she knows it better than anyone. And how she never you, tells me. How long have you been married? <laughs> It'll be 50 years in November. Mazel tov. That's really wonderful. Anyway, I hope I get to see you often. And it's, as we part, say one thing about our friend Marty of Hell, who, again, has done so much. By the way, he, he's more than baseball. But he contributed a great deal to the field of baseball. Say one word about it for me. Well, I called him the uh, portfolio, uh, minister without portfolio of baseball. But, you know, Marty is really such a sweet person. I mean, first of all, he's talented. Yes. Uh, he's written 20 books. And he's a great publicist. And A lovely person. By right, right. You know, he's an absolutely lovely person. Nobody has a bad word to say about Marty Appel. I mean, he's, he's perfect for what he does. And there's, there's two sides of Marty Appel. One is the, one, the guy who wants to sit and write books and not be bothered. And the other is the publicist who has to talk to people all day long. It takes special people like that. You know, he's not a person who's petty, has a big mind, and uh, he's a great guy. It's been wonderful meeting you. Again, I wish you all good success, and I hope you and I sit at this table many, many times. I, I hope so. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. My meeting with Larry Rutman, who is the author of American Jews and America's Game. As always, I invite you to be in touch with me with any thoughts or comments you may have. To my discussion with Larry, please email me, write me, post on our Facebook wall, tweet me. I look forward to hearing from you. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. L'chaim, my friends, to life. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support Shalom TV with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the Shalom TV website homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive on DVD with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support. L'chaim is a presentation of Jewish Education in Media.